Hi, I'm Doug Siglin uh, with the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. Uh, the rumor is quite a bit fuller than it was for breakfast, and uh, it is my honor to introduce another speaker. Those of you that were here at breakfast know that I introduced the last one by showing a film of him breakdancing, Congressman. So we're not going to do that to you right now. You know, something fairly extraordinary happened. Uh, in my experience, it's often difficult to get a member of Congress to come to a conference to talk. Uh, Congressman Glenn Thompson, who you're about to hear from, really wanted to come to this conference. And it seemed a little unusual to us, frankly, because we don't know very much about Congressman Thompson. He's a Republican from North Central Pennsylvania. He's been in the Congress a couple of uh, years, two years, I think. Um, hasn't really been involved in water issues very much before. It was a little bit unusual to find that he really wanted to come here, and because he really wanted to come here, we really wanted to have him. He spent 28 years as a health care professional, always in central Pennsylvania, north central Pennsylvania. He was involved with the Boy Scouts. He was involved with school boards, has degrees from Penn State, from Temple. He's been in Congress a couple years, as I say. But the thing that's the most interesting to me about it is that after two years of service on the Ag Committee, he's been named by the new chairman of the House Ag Committee as the man who's going to be in charge of all the money that goes to conservation in the nation. Conservation credit, a couple other things. That's over $5 billion currently goes to conservation efforts. This is the man who's going to be a principal decision maker about that. I just wanted to make two observations as a former Republican uh, congressional staffer. It was my observation that a lot of Republicans take the notion that conservatives and conservation are equal seriously. There's a wonderful piece written uh, about a decade ago by David Orr, who's a professor out in Ohio, about the joint root of conservation and conservatism. And a lot of people take that really seriously. And I think Congressman Thompson probably considers himself to be a conservative, and I really hope, and I think we all probably hope, that he's one of the people that takes that seriously and also sees himself as a conservationist. The other observation that I want to make is that most members of Congress come to Congress wanting to be problem solvers. There are some who want to be ideologues, but most want to be problem solvers. And we, too, want to be problem solvers. We're advocates, we're proud of being advocates, members of Congress are advocates, they're proud of being advocates, but most of them want to figure out how to solve problems. And we got a problem here that we're talking about in this conference, which is how you can reconcile growth, agricultural growth, societal growth, and still try to maintain the natural resource base, particularly clean water. I have a lot of hope that Congressman Thompson is going to be somebody who is going to be a real problem solver for us. He's probably going to be with us for quite a long time. He is going to, going to be playing a large role in the things that we care about. And I'm very interested to hear how he's going to approach it. And I hope you'll give him a good, warm welcome. Congressman Glenn Thompson. Well, good afternoon, everyone. And Doug, thank you for that introduction. Uh, I am uh, very pleased to say that uh, I'm glad nobody provided any videos of me dancing in any way. Because yeah, it would have been a humorous introduction, but it wouldn't have been pretty. So uh, thank you so much for the, uh, for the invitation to, to be here, to join you, uh, to be able to share some thoughts as, uh, as we start the 112th Congress. And, and uh, frankly, as I... Uh, um, I look at every two years of starting a new job. That's where the citizens of the Pennsylvania 5th District have, uh, through their confidence, renewed my contract for two more years. And, uh, and I, uh, first of all, I want to, uh, I'm also thankful for the confidence of the agriculture chairman in the 112th Congress, uh, Mr. Frank Lucas from Oklahoma, who, who approached me and asked me to uh, serve as the uh, Conservation Energy and Forestry Subcommittee Chair. Not a, uh, not something that I anticipated uh, at the, uh, um, having uh, come to Congress uh, two years ago after, uh, frankly, a lifetime of serving my, uh, my community and serving individuals facing life-changing disease and disability. Uh, it really is a privilege to be here. I want to, obviously, uh, uh, I've, uh, uh, there's 
folks from uh, obviously a lot of states here be, uh, with the nature and the scope of this organization, the Chesapeake Bay that, and the, uh, where that watershed flows. But I want to certainly acknowledge Penn Futures. Dan Jarrett is here. I've had uh, 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 just a privilege this past two years. One of my uh, very close colleagues is an individual formerly with Penn Futures, Secretary John Hanger, uh, who uh, we have uh, worked together on, on uh, issues in Pennsylvania and uh, both in his office and in Harrisburg, my office in Washington, and uh, um, he has been certainly just a tremendous resource. Uh, be certainly, obviously, before I start my remarks, I uh, uh, this is a uh, kind of a solemn time in Washington, and I uh, wanted to uh, just uh, say there's certainly our thoughts and prayers are, are with those in Arizona that were uh, were taken, those who were wounded and injured, and just such a horrific tragedy that should never have occurred. And certainly thoughts and prayers uh, uh, today and, and this week uh, here in our nation's capital are going to be with uh, Congresswoman Gifford uh, in her recovery and, uh, and, uh, and for all those who were injured and impacted and, uh, by those events. And certainly want to commend the, the uh, local, state, federal uh, law enforcement officials uh, who have been involved as well as our Capitol Police Force for all their efforts over the last several days. All of us are looking to make sense of, of this situation. I don't know if we'll ever find it uh, within the events that occurred. But as we do, we have to have to maintain our support for those seeking recovery and certainly pray uh, for the well-being of those who are involved. My, uh, my congressional district is uh, just a tiny district up in Pennsylvania. Uh, it's 17 counties. It makes up 22 percent of the land mass of Pennsylvania, uh, whereas uh, there are uh, 19 members of Congress. I, I'm lucky enough from Pennsylvania. I'm lucky enough to represent 22% uh, of the land mass, and uh, it's larger than eight states. And and I, I found out uh, two years ago it's larger than the nation of Israel. So uh, it's uh, it's uh, but it's a wonderful congressional district. Uh, the district predominantly is made up of small townships, boroughs, forest lands, and farms. Uh, it is considered by some to be one of the most rural congressional districts actually in the country. Uh, not based on sheer land mass. I have colleagues from the West where my 22% of Pens Pennsylvania looks puny compared to the, uh, to the land mass that they represent. But the fact is, in Pennsylvania 5th District, we have people that live back every hollow and on every ridge. So we're, we're scattered out in a way that, that truly defines, I believe, in my heart, and head, uh, rural America. Uh, Pennsylvania is also located in my district, uh, founded as a land-grant university in 1855. And uh, then today, the university continues to be uh, just a tremendous uh, source of uh, academic research, um, and particularly in the field of, of agriculture and the environment. And, um, and the environment plays an important role in all of my constituents' daily lives in our communities, because many of us are make a living in the 5th District living off the land and certainly living as a part of the land. Uh, farming, forestry, uh, timber harvesting, mineral development is the lifeblood of many, many people in, uh, in Pennsylvania 5th District. Uh, beyond, but beyond our jobs, recreation is a major focal point for my constituents. Uh, if you look at Pennsylvania's number one and number two industries, uh, number one is agriculture. And obviously agriculture shapes a lot of the Pennsylvania 5th District. And number two is recreation. And those two probably define the two of the, the major economic points uh, for not just for Pennsylvania, but certainly within the Pennsylvania 5th Congressional District. Well, we like to hunt, to fish, to hike, to ski, and certainly spend uh, countless hours in the outdoors. I will tell you, that's probably the things I miss the most having taken this job. As uh, Doug was kind enough to talk about a little bit of my background, I spent uh, uh, 30 years. This is my 41st year in scouting. Uh, since I've been 11 years old, a scoutmaster for 30 years. Uh, uh, I miss those campouts, even the January ones in the Pennsylvania 5th District. So, uh, having said that, uh, we all support restoring the Bay. It's the right thing to do. Uh, and we fully recognize that land and agricultural practices play a major role in those efforts. Uh, I, I think the, just the example of the previous speaker, a very impressive project uh, that uh, yeah, it has so many uh, beneficial outcomes, as, as he outlined, uh, not just cleaning up the bay, but generating energy across the board. And together, we should celebrate the progress that we've made in restoring the bay. 
the foundation, uh, this foundation, Chesapeake Bay Foundation, uh, just last week uh, um, uh, outlined in the article, and you've probably had sessions, I'm sure, on this uh, already uh, today, uh, uh, just outlined some of that, that progress uh, in the State of the Bay report. Uh, the Bay report card stating that there were significant hurdles ahead, but certainly reasons for optimism with, with the indicators that reflected. The numerical index of the Bay's health jumped three points from 2008 to 2010, with eight of 15 indicators rising. And I think uh, everyone is to be congratulated for, uh, for that progress. You know, those who are here, uh, those who are on our farms along the watershed, those who are uh, living in the, in the municipalities along the watershed, this is something that, uh, that occurs working together. Uh, now, for example, the, uh, the indicator for the health of the blue crab population rose 15 points, and the numbers increased dramatically last year due to the ongoing conservation efforts. Now, I support congressional, uh, uh, um, congr congressional incentives and the variety of conservation programs. Uh, in fact, I was uh, uh, Saturday morning where uh, um, uh, early in the morning, even up in Pennsylvania, I was out uh, on a farm. Uh, 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 hiking around looking at CREP programs and examples of CSP programs and uh, trying to keep my feet warm. Um, but, uh, but looking at uh, what our conservation programs uh, can, uh, can do. Uh, to name a few, certainly the Conservation Reserve Program, the Conservation Reserve Enhancement Program, and the Environmental Quality Incentives Program. Uh, all. Um, excellent programs, pro and we're making progress through these incentives and programs, but these efforts take time. We know that. You know, this is not something that we can tie uh, uh, a direct immediate result. Uh, it takes uh, sometimes a matter of years uh, to see outcomes from actions that we take today. Aside from agriculture, um, uh, e EPA's uh, proposed rulemaking on the total maximum daily load, the TMDL, will have uh, major effects on many areas in my district. Um, and I have some, some concerns over that, I'll be honest with you. This includes many small rural municipalities and boroughs. I've had uh, more than one township supervisor come up to me and ask me a question that, uh, you know, and as an elected official, you don't like to not at least have somewhat of an answer when you have a constituent come to you. But when they come to you and say, we're just frustrated. We can't comply with all these mandates, not all related, obviously, m many outside the scope of Chesapeake Bay initiatives, uh, all the mandates that come from the federal government. Their question for me is, who do we turn the keys over to uh, when we want to walk away uh, from, from leading uh, these uh, local townships and boroughs and cities? Um, the, uh, there are many areas that just simply don't have the money to comply with these with unfunded mandates, you know, such as costly upgrades. Now, Pennsylvania's watershed implement, implementation plan appears to be a, a reasonable start, in my estimate. However, I believe that we should take a moment and pause on the TMDL before implementing it to uh, EPA standards. Uh, a report prepared for the Agricultural Nutrient Policy Council found major discrepancies between the EPA and USDA's load estimates for the Bay. And although EPA and USDA's estimates of the nitrogen load attributed by, the agri by agriculture are within 3%, the phosphorus estimates are noticeably different, 44 to 37%, a difference of 7%. Uh, sediment is even more striking. EPA's estimates that agriculture contributes 65%, with USDA suggests only 14%. That is a difference of 51%. The point is that the EPA and USDA don't agree on what agriculture's footprint is on the Bay. I think the first step we should take is to produce new nonpartisan assessment on, of the condition of the Bay that takes into account the effects of ongoing conservation projects and practices. And not just those that are funded by the government, not those that are just mandated, but an honest assessment of all the efforts that have been made in a voluntary way uh, of, of best practices uh, over time. The um, because many of these conservation best practices are voluntary, EPA often doesn't recognize the efforts. The science must be at the forefront in restoring the bay. The authorize, authorization of the Chesapeake uh, expired in 2010, so there's a question as to le the legality of the EPA moving forward on the TMDL. 
to achieve to date, achieving water quality goals for the Chesapeake Bay has been dependent on strong and balanced partnership at the local, state, and federal levels. Uh, yet this is almost the, uh, the pilot program to go forward with TMDL, TMDL nationwide, next going to the Mississippi River Basin. Now whether you're a, uh, a, an environmentalist or a developer or a farmer, uh, the goal of a healthy watershed and healthy bays, rivers, is a shared dream and vision that we all need to be committed to. Uh, demonizing any particular population like farmers or developers, frankly, is counterproductive. Now, a letter from the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection and the Department of Agriculture to uh, Senator Ben Cardin last year is, uh, provides some, I think it uh, is illustrative. Now, quote, the key to success in addressing a non-point source of pollution problem is using the right tool for the jobs at the correct time. Some situations call for technical or financial assistance, some may call for a regulatory approach, and some call for a mix of both, and the key is balance. Accountability is key to the success of the restoration effort, and flexibility must be a part of the accountability. And they went on to write, uh, adopting a heavy-handed or unbalanced approach will only drive farmers and landowners and local government officials away from compliance or out of business. On the other hand, if we work smartly with a balanced approach and allow the agency with the appropriate skills and necessary tools to work with this diverse group of local landowners and decision makers, we will have a greater balance, greater chance of accomplishing our goal of clean water, vibrant communities, and economically thriving farms. Now, whether Republican or Democrat, Tea Party or Independent, uh, we should be looking at ways to remove the impediments to doing the right thing for the Bay. Uh, there are some wonderful techno technological solutions to large farm pollution we, we just heard about, a great example. Um, and currently there are vendors working with some states to develop digesters for potential on-farm heat and energy. And you may have heard the story last week that bacteria ate all the methane produced in the Gulf of Mexico BP oil spill. Manure di digesters are similar in that anaerobic digesters take inputs of cow manure or other feedstock like spoiled silage and hay, biomass crops, or food waste into a heated anaerobic environment. Naturally occurring bacteria will degrade the volatile uh, solids, releasing a combination of carbon dioxide and methane, which may be burned and, or combusted for energy production. The, the process kills common pathogens and eliminates odors. To me, that sounds like a win-win solution. Uh, we have uh, we have solved a TMDL problem with a solution that also creates energy, addressing two of our major priorities I think we have in this country. For example, in the areas of Franklin and Lancaster counties, um, and although my district is large, it's not that large, um, uh, it doesn't take those in, regional digesters could help reduce 32% of those counties' manure loads. But in some instances, state regulations stand in the way of new technologies, and others, the EPA is often dismissive of such ideas. Now, Pennsylvania's Department of Environmental Protection and the Ag Department recommend a, an EPA technology development fund to support those kinds of solutions and innovations. As environmental organizations, how many of you are willing to find solutions so that people do the right thing? Instead, do we have, we, instead we have the EPA seeking to impose expensive and possibly punishing regulations. That doesn't speak to the balance that the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection wrote about to Senator Cardin and certainly doesn't say balance to me. Um, in Washington this week, there, there's a, um, a shared mix of emotion, including uh, shock, disbelief, and sadness over the tragic and evil events that occurred in Arizona over the weekend. And while Washington is certainly a city of uh, differences of opinions and passionate views, the great diversity sometimes very polarized. Our shared grief over with the attack on Saturday reminds us that we are one people. As one people, there's no problem that we cannot overcome. As one people, we must respect and appreciate that diversity of views and opinions challenge us to better government and sounder public policy in the end. And as one people, we, we have a responsibility to allow all views to be represented in an open and transparent debate, ensuring that science and facts are center stage in the drafting of public policy. 
I want to uh, thank you for uh, for what you are doing. I want to thank you for what you've done to uh, to uh, uh, help continue to clean up the bay and to restore the bay and and to be a part of that uh, team along with the uh, the farmers and the municipalities, the citizens that obviously live uh, in all the states that uh, where that watershed flows. And um, thank you for the opportunity to join you today and, and the invitation to to, to, uh, to be here this afternoon. Thank you. Representative Thompson, if there's one thing that's very, very clear to me, it's that the U.S. Ag Committees can play a profound role on the cleanup of the Chesapeake Bay, finding that balance that we need in the TMDL between voluntary programs, incentive programs, and regulatory programs. And so I, for one, am incredibly um, heartened that you know the region, you know the watershed, you know the convictions of the people, and you yourself uh, share many of them. And we look forward to working with you uh, to make sure that the agricultural community has all the support they need. Thank you very, very much.